Good morning to all of you. Thank you for being there. Today, we have a very interesting talk about Westland modernism, the disenchantment of myth. This is a <clears throat> new critical approach to a very important theme, the Westland modernism. And viewed by Rebecca Walberto through a very important set of novels, poems, books in the 20th century. The Wastelands by Eliot, T.S. Eliot, um, Fitzgerald's Great Gatsby, uh, the Dos Passos Manhattan Transfer, to name a few. Well, uh, I should say that this study has been awarded by the by Asteria International Association of Myth Criticism with the 21st prize. And we have today Rebecca Gualberto with us. Thank you for being there, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Manuel, for your invitation. Yes. And, yes. Um, yes, yeah. I have read the book, and yet I'm thrilled to know what Rebecca has to say to us today. What, why is this um, myth so important in our day, and what can the myth criticism approach to tell us? Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Now you are going to speak about 40 minutes, and at the end there will be a set of 10 minutes for questions and to have a very nice debate, discussion. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Bye. Uh, thank you, thank you, Jose Manuel. Thank you, as I said, for the invitation for um, being here today and for the chance uh, to talk about the Wasteland. Thank you for the introduction about Wasteland Modernism, the book. Today, I am going to focus on uh, the poem by the study of the Wasteland um, as a way to celebrate um, the centenary of publication of, of the poem, which is uh, this year. So, um, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland is no introduction. It was published in 1922, and its enormous and everlasting influence on modern literature in English was immediate. But still today, on the centenary of publication, if we attempt a myth critical analysis of the poem for Manganaro, the most famous use of anthropology, in modernist literature, it seems practical to follow the author's advice and to go back to the critical sources uh, that he identifies as fundamental references for understanding how myth operates in the poem. Bizarre Western's book on the great legend from ritual to romance and Fraser's wide range anthropological study, The Golden Bow. Of course, critics have agreed over the decades that the influence of Western's book was somewhat limited in the actual composition of the poem. Yet it is reasonable to argue that the choice of the wasteland as a governing metaphor in the poem was actually the influence of Western, since, um, as Juliot explains, Western argues that the scholars must focus on the story of the wasteland and the wounded Fisher King in the great romances rather than on the story, than on the story of the hero's quest. Um, this serves as a structural or guiding model for the poem, as Julio says, but also, as Julio also um, explained, Weston implicitly argues that, I quote, the very wholeness of medieval romance is the symptom of the loss of rituals. And this is also a fundamental topic in Eliot's poem. Arthurian experts, Lupac and Lupac, agree that Eliot probably recalled this centrality of the wasteland and of its need for restoration as a unifying motive in the great legend. This may explain what um, Uliot calls the structural and methodological indebtedness of uh, the Western of a poem in which references to the Fisher King, the mythical wounded king who governs over the wasteland in Chrétien de Troyes' first of all, the story of the grail, are shaped in many different ways and provide a discontinuous rhythm to a great complexity 
of mythical, religious, historical, and literary allusion. Notoriously, uh, Lewis once claimed that a poem that is to contain all myths cannot construct itself upon one. Indeed, the wasteland is not construed solely upon one single myth, but it does juxtapose uh, and certainly clip fragments, as Longeback says, that do not feel coherent due to narrative continuity or dramatic situation, but because of what Longeback calls a certainty of tone that is eloquently expressed in the guiding elements of, that make up the wasteland myth, the theme of illness, the topics of sterility and sexual impotence, the narrative structure of the quest, the drop of the king's sacrifice of death, the cycling movement of the season, and the communal longing for regeneration. Moreover, Western Smith ritualist perspective offers a representational advantage since the claim that every rite of sacrifice inheres to the later myth allows for presentation of ritual as an embodiment of myth. In effect, this reverses the loss of ritual that produced medieval romance in Western argument, which constitutes a remaking of pre-modern myth. A distinguishable feature in the representation of the myth of the wasteland in Eliot's poem are the various main king figures that often take the shape of the divine king, who, according to Western, hovers in the shadowy background of our history. The future king for Western is a romantic version of this divine or semi-divine ruler at once God and King, upon whose life and unimpaired vitality the existence of his land and people directly depend. He is not an archetype for every character in the poem, nor does he articula articulate as an individual self the many voices in the poem. He is, however, a paradigmatic model for a high number of characters. The wasteland is, after all, the consequence of the Fisher King's injury, and thus he must be either healed or successfully succeeded through a sacrifice or death so that the land can be restored. Both scenarios are repeatedly represented in the poem, and both are portrayed as ultimately futile. Perhaps, since succession stories are better established throughout, throughout tradition, scenes of sacrifice and death are also more numerous in the wasteland. Victims such as the Phoenician sailor in Death by Water, Jesus Christ in What the Thunder Said, or Stetson's corpse in The Burial of the Dead are only the most well known among several examples of what Booker and Bentley explain as the same mythic impulse towards ensuring the fertility of the earth by ritualistically, by ritualistically killing heroes and kings. The impulse is, however, entirely new. The myth reshaped and rewritten is transformed from a myth of regeneration into a myth of degeneration. Such degenerative reinterpretation is carried out mostly by a multiplication of symbols that are progressively more and more ambivalent and unreliable. Stigol claims that while, I quote, myth is commonly taken to be words, often in the form of a story, Myth ritualism remakes it so it does not stand by itself, but is tied to ritual. Myth becomes action, necessarily transcendent. It encodes the magical meaning to, to warrant the survival of the community. It has a social purpose. It supplies what is called a structure of values. It holds the community together and ensures its proper functioning. Yet, if the myth of regeneration that secures communal survival is transformed, rewritten as a myth of the generation, its magical meaning is dependent. The myth will no longer redeem the community, but enact its dissolution. In the wasteland, as Cole explains, the thematics and imagery of the world underline the poem at many levels, beginning with its memorial opening and encompassing its burning cities, soldier songs, Tells of uh, London citizenry, ubiquitous death, burial phobias, even the rats. The possibility of regeneration seems far fetched, even when the land is physically reborn. Whereas in the medieval sources, the physical renewal of the land's fertility brought along the restoration of peace and social welfare, 
The Earth coming back to life in the spring is an act of cruelty in the modern wasteland. April is the cruelest month, breathing, lilacs out of the deadland, mixing, memory and desire stirring, dull roots with the spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering, earth in forgetful snow, feeding, a little life with dry children. The undertone is apocalyptic. The earth regenerates and will continue to do so for the rest of eternity. But eternal life is the utmost form of cruelty for the war ravaged, wasted world that remains. In her fundamental study on violence and modernism, Sarah Cole finds in these iconic lines, I quote, multiple violences on the way death and land conjure one another, including the vegetative structure of resurrection. She writes that, I quote, the lines in both the parched earth, which nevertheless will breathe, the land impregnated by dead valleys, no man's land made general, and the cruel discomfort and pain of bringing blossoms out of such soil. As she claims, the beginning of the poem ties the loss and death of the Great War to the inevitable cycling of the seasons, which is poignant as far as the horror of war cannot in this way be altered or avoided. For Cole, the beginning of the poem ironizes the truism that the violence of war can be germinative, which clearly undercuts the magical potency of the alleged ritual of resurrection that underscores the use of myth in the poem. In his famous 1923 review of Joyce's Ulysses, Eliot seemed to clearly advocate for the benefit of using myth as a strategy to give order and meaning to the chaos of the contemporary world. And as some critics have argued, the, the use of myth in the poem may provide some sense, some sense of order, or at least the illusion of order. But in any case, the argument that primitive myth can restore order and meaning in a world wrecked by chaos, this regards the fact that to complete such purpose, myth has to be reshaped. It is the case in The Wasteland, a poem that, as Davidson explains, treats myth, history, art, and religion as subject to the same fragmentation, appropriation, and degradation as modern life. Eliot himself critiques Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring because it remained what he called a pageant of primitive culture, in which in everything except in music, one missed the sense of the present. The words reveal that for Eliot, the contemporary recreation of myth requires that it is updated and transformed to give a good account of the present. In relation to this, Falk argues that the poem makes desperate efforts to reestablish cultural hierarchy out of anarchy by a poetic arrangement of disparate fragments. But it is the particular arrangement of the fragments that expresses the futility of such a desire for recovery. That um, Longbaum calls it that very, mi very minimum of restless aliveness that propels the characters to repeat the archetypal pattern of the Grail quest. By the time the speaker reaches the chapel perilous, where the Grail should have been waiting, the place is empty and poses no threat. There is the empty chapel, only the wind's home. It has no windows and the door swings. Dry bones can harm no one. As Lubach and Lubach explain, with the chapter divested of its dangers and trials, there is no chance for a hero to prove his courage and virtue, and thus to prove himself worthy of achieving the grave, if there were a hero, that is. The fragments are barely recognizable, even when the visit to the chapel is followed by the dry, sterile thunder, finally bringing down the monks awaiting rain. A different sound accompanies the rain. It is a single syllable, da, interpreted by the gods as meaning cambiata, consort, by the men as data, peace, and by the demons as the yandham, pity. The voice of the founder, as heard in the Upanishad, the sacred book of Hinduism, may suggest a form of redemptive knowledge acquired by the great knight at the end of his quest. But such knowledge, if, he, if it exists at all, is necessarily polysemic and ambivalent. It raises the problem of interpretation, what coy terms over determination, liminality, or doubleness in his view, and in mine, I should add, 
uh, the main characteristics of a poem that inhabits both sides of an opposition. These are his words. What the thunder said uh, begins with the description of a desert that is finally relieved by the rain. The hopes for regeneration seem corroborated by the presence of resurrected Christ in this fifth canto, in a vignette that recalls the story of the two men on the road to Emmaus. These lines apparently resolve the first lines of the section, which seem to recreate the passion, poeticizing a transition from death to resurrection. Yet, as Eliot explains in a note, the lines that retell an episode from the Gospel were inspired by the narrative of an Antarctic expedition in which, I quote Eliot, it was related that the party of explorers at the extremity of their strength had the constant illusion that there was one more member that could actually be counted. Both references simultaneously embody a manifest providence, but while the Antarctic explorer Shackleton, Eliot's source, claims that they, I quote, have seen God in his caramel raptures and heard the text of that nature renders and reach the naked soul of man, Eliot characterizes such apparition as a constant delusion, doubling the meaning of a reference that simultaneously signifies redemption and exhaustion. In this regard, the debilitated stream of consciousness of the speaker before the apparition is highly eloquent. The faltering rhythm of these short lines, the inconsistent discourse, and the frequent repetitions recall an early exhausted state of consciousness, which uh, resignifies the apparition of Christ into a hallucination suffered by the dehydrated explorers who wander the wasteland. The double image points towards the inevitable failure of heroic action in the wasteland. Shackleton meant to traverse the Antarctic by foot but his teeth uh, was trapped in the ice before he could actually reach the continent. And at the same time, negates the possibility of resurrection. If Christ's redemptive sacrifice is a hallucination, the ritual meaning underneath the myth is empty out of meaning. The killing of the divine king can no longer resurrect the wasteland because as Brooker and Bentley note, and I quote, Christ, all the heroes of fertility myths, the tradition of revering such figures and mythic consciousness itself seems to be dead in the reverberation of a spring thunder over distant mountains. This is the fate of ritual and transcendence in the poem, and it is the effect of this doubleness of references. As Coyle argues, I quote, both interpretations need to be there, each destabilizing even as it implies the other. Tarot is another example. Weston claimed that its original use had been to predict the rise and fall of the waters which brought fertility to the land. In Western hypothesis, the four suits of tarot, cup, lance, sword, and pentacle or dish correspond with the grey myth central symbols, um, that is the cup, the lance, the dish, and the sword. These symbols conform, um, which she explains as a group of fertility symbols connected with very ancient rituals of which fragmentary survivals alone have been preserved to us. Those fragments of ritual are collected in the wasteland and presented as dramatizing the conflict between modern debatement and ancient mysticism. If in antiquity the tarot was used to predict the water rising in the springtime, in Eliot's poem, the fortune teller Madame Sosby also heralds the coming of the waters. But in the contemporary death-ridden world of the wasteland, the rising waters do not bring along the land's rebirth, but a catastrophic flood. Madame Sosostri cautions the reader to fear death by water, transforming the announcement of regeneration into an admonition for danger. Brooks argued that um, the fortune telling, which is taken ironically by a 20th century uh, reader, becomes true as the poem develops. This is explained by the cards that Madame Sosostri reveals. Um, in the first canto, the drowned Phoenician sailor, the lady of the rocks, the man with the three estates, the wheel, the one-eyed merchant, and a blank card. She does not reveal the hangman. The cards, of course, are not real tarot cards, a sign that the ritual has lost the power of ancient mysticism. And yet, the seemingly ludicrous set effectively predicts the characters and events that the reader will find along the poem. 
Elliot explained in a note that I quote, I am not familiar with the exact constitution of the tarot cards of cards from which I have obviously departed to suit my own convenience. The handman, a member of the traditional pack, fits my purpose in two ways. Because he is associated in my mind with the hand god of Fraser, and because I associate him with a hooded figure in the passage of the disciples to Emmaus in part five. The Phoenician sailor and the merchant appear later, also the crowds of people, and the night water is executed in part four. The man with his tapes, an authentic member of the tarot pack, I associate quite arbitrarily with the Fisher king himself. The tarot characters are then the characters of the poem, all of whom are presented as multiple representations of the same mythical archetypes. As Eliot explains in a different note, the merchant melts into the Phoenician sailor, and the latter is not wholly distinct from Ferdinand, prince of Naples. That is why the leitmotif extracted from Shakespeare's The Tempest, those are tales of where he sighs. Follow uh, the apparition of the Phoenician sailor in Madame Sussostri's pack. Uh, by the time the reader reaches the poem's ending, all the made up cards have appeared recurrently. The fortune teller's predictions have unexpectedly been fulfilled, and consequently, the reader cannot but trust her warning and distrust the rising of the waters. False becomes true, and meaning arises from how the poem invites contradictory interpretations. Expectations of rebirth arise, and the tarot regains its ritual force. But this has gone dark. The cards can only predict the annihilating flood. The resignification of ritual in the wasteland is inextricable from the reshaping of the mode of romance in the poem. As argued, Eliot's indebtedness to Western is not mainly the borrowing of a set of symbols from the great legend, but how the poem relies on Western's argument about the loss of ritual in medieval romance. In Eliot's poem, the elusiveness of a quest pattern uh, for the poem uses myth, as Mangamaro argues, as a non-narrative device, certifies the dissolution of romance, now the broken carcass of an empty ritual. The consciousness of the modern hero has shattered, and this is the consequence of the fracture of myth. That is the rapture of uh, what Nietzsche called the Apolline illusion that prevents the negation of individual existence when the individual approaches a purely Dionysiac experience of reality. Nietzsche uh, explains myth, what he calls myth as symbol, by giving account of its function in Wagner's uh, Tristan and his own. As he argues, the perception of the third act of the opera, I quote, purely as a vast symphonic movement with no assistance from words of images, would shatter the consciousness of the individual. But consciousness is safe thanks to the assistance from words, that is, by the sudden interposition of myth. Words interfere when Tristan speaks, and, I quote Nietzsche, what has seemed to us earlier, like some hollow sigh from the center of being, now tells us only how barren and empty is the sea. The words are the myth that shelters consciousness, but out of their operatic uh, context, extracted by Eliot, they become in the wasteland one more fragment of a broken myth. These same words are interposed as the feeble remains of an old Apollonian illusion that futilely attempts to arrest the dissolution of the speaker's fractured consciousness. Your arms full and your hair wet I could not speak, and my eyes stayed. I was neither living nor dead, and I knew nothing. Looking into the heart of life, the silence, Odulea does now. The loss of myth entails the shattering of consciousness because a mythical apprehension of the world represents, uh, I quote Malin, the struggle of the individual to sustain an illusion of self that can withstand the disturbing force of the Dionysian realm of consciousness. The necessary pulling apart of primitive myth in the wasteland begins to dissolve that illusion, as it can barely hold up the consciousness of the neither living nor dead wanderers of the modern wasteland. Myth intervenes again and again, attempts to set order and provide comprehensible meaning, but it intervenes after it has been broken in the shape of fragments short against the room. As previously mentioned, the fragment of pre-modern mythology found most frequently in the poem is the Fisher King. 
Of the many Fisher King figures, one of the most significant is the Phoenician sailor, Lebel, whose death by water is, um, is, is, is um, described in the very short for Canto. This death by water may seem a form of redemptive, purifying passing, if one disregards Madame Sosostri's warning to fear death by water. His death is foretold in the future in the fortune teller's divination. His car is immediately followed by the light motif, those are bells that were his eyes. This connects the Phoenician sailor with Shakespeare's royal figures in the temple. Traditionally, Ariel's song in the Tempest has been thought to signify that Alonso's death constitutes, I quote Brooks, a portal into the realm of the rich and strange, a death which becomes a sort of birth. From this perspective, the death of Clivat may be considered redemptive, a recreation of the vegetation's god regenerative death that is meant to bring about the restoration of the land's fertility. In this sense, the Phoenician sailor is identified with the old Phoenician god Adonis, as since effigies of this god, as Weston explains, were thrown to the sea during the celebration of fertility rites in ancient Greece. But again, expectations of regeneration are thwarted when the Phoenician sailor merges into a different character, Mr. Eugenides, the merchant from Smyrna, an identification explained by Eliot in a note. The correspondence between both characters is not random, however. According to Weston's research, Syrian merchants introduced in Europe the esoteric mystery that, uh, that she establishes as real legend sources. However, in the poem, such a mystical exchange is replaced by a careless sexual offer when the Eastern merchant asks the speaker, uh, I quote the poem, in demotic French, to luncheon at the Cannon Street Hotel followed by a weekend at the Metropole. As it happened with the hooded figure in what the founder said, the overdetermination of the Phoenician sailor as embodying Adonis, Mr. Eugenides, Ferdinand, and even Alonso, undermines the assumption that his death by water brings along redemption. This perspective seems to corroborate Simbardo's argument that Ariel Song expressing Alonso's transformations to death into something beautiful and durable does not celebrate, I quote, a process of regeneration into something more nobly human, but the transfiction of the human into a rich permanent, but a lifeless one. This lifeless permanent is the defining trait of the theme that opens the second canto, where life is petrified around Queen Cleopatra. She sits on her throne while around her, as Kenner famously argued, all things deny nature. The material seems to come to life while she remains savagely still, trapped between desire and paralysis, as the iconic Dolores uh, steer with a spring rain at the beginning of the poem. While she combs her hair, Cleopatra listens attentively to the sound of footsteps on the stairs, but the expectation of a sexual encounter is arrested till the next canto. The queen merges into the young Titus, who, after the departure of her lover, I quote the poem, faces about her room again, alone, smooths her hair with automatic hands, and puts the record on the ground floor. The parallelism between the two scenes and characters suggests that the sexual encounter, violent and indifferent at the same time, has done little to relieve the queen's tension. In fact, it has aggravated the paralysis. As Brooker and Bentley argue, the images that frame the scene in the fire sermon the human engine as a taxi, and the typist's arm as part of a gramophone, identify the typist with an automaton. Simultaneously, the clerk is presented as an animal with, I quote, an itch that requires scratching. For Brooks, the scene represented a world where, I quote, lust drives forward urgently and scientifically to the immediate extirpation of the desire and defeat its own end. For Brooker and Bambi, uh, the section is a dramatization not of lust, but of the absence of lust. Yet, whether lust defeats its own purpose or remains unattainable in a context of dehumanization, it seems clear that both inanimateness and lust are the specific shapes of the sexual violence enacted upon the female body in the poem, as Scully argues. As the typist's automatic hand puts a record on the gramophone, she morphs into a sort of bionic philomela, 
But what McPhee argues that Philomela's violent transformation into a nightingale is displayed into the gramophone singing the song in her set, it is crucial to bear in mind that Philomela can speak, so only her voiceless Jack Jack resonates here and there in the poem. The scene of the Claire assaulting at once the psychist may represent the cultural malaise of undesire, as McPhee argues. But violence is visibly simmering beneath boredom and frustration. Philomela told the story of her rape by weaving a tapestry because Therese had cut off her tongue. The iconic representation is displayed in Cleopatra's throne room in a game of chess, showcasing how rape and mutilation are, as Cole argues, enchanted into art. Yet the poem is not complacent. As Cole argues, the wasteland may recognize the symbolic and cultural potency of violence, but it, I quote, recoils from the brutality that sustains that edit. The sexual palette of the poem, as Query notes, is made of corruption, indifference, disappointment, violence, and of bodies that are mere collections of parts. The violent clerk, an incarnation of Tereos insofar as the type it may embody Philomela, is carbuncular, thick. For Lupac and Lupac, his sickness alludes to the castrating wound of the Fisher King, which establishes the humanized sexuality as another form of malfunction that acquires a mythical dimension. Violence is another shape of the wound, and the sick, animalistic class is a different personification of the same archetype. Whether motivated by violence or barrenness, life and love are equally sterile in the poem. As Kenner noted, the king is invisible in a game of chess, but the weak, practically immobile king of chess is no different from Therese in the poem. Lil's husband is coming home from war, and after four years in the army, I quote the poem, he wants a good time. Toothless and looking antique at 31, Lil has little to hope for. She has never been the same after taking some pills to terminate her sick pregnancy. She had had five children already, and the fifth one almost killed her. The prospect of her husband coming home threatens her life. There is no alternative then. Violence and sickness take many shapes, indifference, frustration, isolation, isolation. But regardless of the specific symptoms of sexual and affective dysfunction, love and desire are irrevocably doomed to failure as generative forces of life. Sarah Cole, in her theoretical categorization of enchanted and disenchanted violence, claims that war is the phenomenon that most powerfully calls for a dichotomized understanding of violent death as either, I quote, a sign and precipitator of sublimity or a sign and precipitator of total degeneration and waste. In the wasteland, this double understanding is sustained because of how the enchantment of myth attempts to detain modernity disenchantment. Cole follows Weber to explain how, in modern times, uh, rationalism, materialism, and the institutionalization of life take the place of sacredness and spirituality. This results in what Cole calls the denuding of the magical, that is somehow resisted towards the end of the 19th century in the primitivism and anthropology, Fraser and Western are good examples of this, that enchant ritual violence to recognize its transformative power. Myth ritualism, and more specifically, uh, the conception of myth advanced by this school of thought, is a clear example of enchanted violence. In Eliot's poem, this enchantment of violence is um, directly confronted with the harsh reality of another paradigm of generative violence, war and its transformation of violent death into what Cole uh, defines as something positive, communal, perhaps even sacred. According to Cole's thesis, the wasteland threads the fine line between enchantment and disenchantment, not clearly opting for one single understanding of violence, executing a balancing act, and uh, trading on the power of, of violence instead. I quote, at times appropriating its force and created something uh, especially brilliant, at other times, succumbing to the steer ruin that violence leaves in its wake. But in Hansen, on the contrary, believes that the poem, I quote, is steeped far more toward disenchantment than enchantment, as it is a poem distressed by violence, but not redeemed 
by the artistic project that underlies it. My own insights concur, but, one, one, but goes one step farther. The representation of violence in the poem, or rather, as Fadenhausen very well notices, the representation of the aftermath of violence does not simply carry out a disenchantment of violent death, but realizes a disenchantment of myth itself. The Wasteland opens with a passage that Armin Paul Frank defined as the root consciousness vignette, which is revealed as uttering the consciousness of the dead bodies buried underground at the end of the first canto. The mythical wasteland takes here the shape of a real historical wasteland holding within a generation of corpses killed too soon violently massacred. Towards the end of the burial of the dead amid this literal wasteland, the speaker meets a fellow soldier. There I saw one I knew and stopped him crying, Dead son, you who were with me in the ship that me lie, that cause you planted last year in your garden. Has it begun to sprout? Will it bloom this year? Or has the sun and frost disturbed its death? These are the worst survivors, plucked from the land and incapable of putting, of putting down roots themselves, planting corpses instead. Langbaum saw in the speaker's question, I quote, a, shock, a shocking substitution of corpse for seed that reminds us that the corpses are a kind of seed and that this truth was symbolized in the old vegetation ritual. But as Booker and Bendy noted, such rituals, for, uh, such rituals were unimaginable to Stetson and the speaker. Uh, for these authors, the two characters have asked themselves the question, how can a dead man, whether he was God, hero, or Stetson, restore fertility to the land? And come up with the same answer. The only way for a dead man to restore fertility to a garden is for him to remain buried in that garden. He can there decompose and serve as fertilizer. This is a clear instance of disenchantment. It is uh, what Booker and Bradley define as a grotesque process of literalization that once again certifies the collapse of the symbolic parameters of romance in a world where uh, Brooker and Bagley argues the transcendent either does not exist or is irrelevant. But the disenchantment is a consequence of violence. The speaker recognizes the spectrum among the ghostly crowd that flows over the unreal city as he reflects on how he had not thought death had undone so many. Spectrum, like the speaker, is a ghost. They are no more alive than the corpse planted in a spectrum garden. As Monikowski writes about self-shocked uh, soldiers, they are the living dead, animated by death and not by life. But this invisible wound afflicts not only soldiers in Eliot's poem, but all survivors. At the brink of the dissolution of the self, the speaker was neither living nor dead. In a game of chess, the speaker is anxiously questioned, are you alive or not? As Wadenhausen writes, the fair answer to the question is, Neither. This is the cruelty of April. The eternal recurrence of a spring will prolong forever the little life of those who live in the wasteland. The undertones are once again apocalyptic. New life is born out of a land and naturally and extensively crammed with dead young men. And therefore carries dead with it into each new iteration of the natural cycle. The corpses are the material embodiment of the world, as Van Houten explains. Turn to see the, the bodies, and thus the world, infect every inch of life after the world. The corpses looking up at the spring from the royal place become indistinguishable from the ghosts of the survivors, because they too, as Levinson explains, have a little life that allows them to rise from their graves and wander the earth like the living dead. Spiritually, as references to Dante express, corpses and ghosts linger somewhere between salvation and condemnation. David Ward argues that the mythical wasteland is the interval between a death and a birth, the winter of the year and the winter of the soul. Once the winter of the year has come to pass, the wasteland remains without escape in the winter of the soul. In the last stanza of the poem, reappears the fisher king that appeared before in the fire ceremony. Fishing in the dark canal while a rat crept softly to the vegetation, dragging its slimy belly on the bank. Still in the wasteland, he sits 
and waves and wonders. I sat upon the shore, fishing, with the arid plain behind me. Shall I at least set my lines in, set my lines in order? The last lines of the poem provide an answer to the question. The first line is a children's nursery rhyme that connotes the catastrophic collapse of the modern metropolis. The second is a quote from Dante's Purgatorio that once again denotes a suspension of salvation. The third recovers the myth of Philomela, the pervasiveness of sexual violence that permeates the poem. The fourth, from a sonnet by Gerard de Nerval, recalls the desolation of the medieval wasteland. These are the fragments referred to in the next line, when the king speaks again, recognizing in himself the ruin, violence, and madness of Thomas Pitt's Hieronymus. This is the work, the summary of the allusions, the fragments that make up the poem. But they are not sure up against the scaffold of me. They reverberate in me. They are juxtaposed to one another, but not aligned in a narrative. They construe a rhythm that does not lead to a logical patterning because, on the contrary, these figures, as Scully explains, fracture the graphic surface of the poem and disorder it. As Blanton has argued, I quote, uh, metonymically, each fragment activates a different portion of the scattered poem, recalling a recurring motif. As he explained, each line achieves a different density of sound and sense, effectively overcoding or oversaturating each available fragment. But as he concludes, the poem does not provide any articulation capable of binding one, fra one fragment meaningfully to the next. What determines that the poem's ultimate substance is defined by the paradoxical fact that it is not there. As critics have long established, the onomatopoeic nature of shanti, shanti, shanti lets the rain be heard. But the mythical scaffolding that should provide a definite meaning for the rain is nowhere to be found. There is not a conclusive narrative pattern for the quest. There is not an ambiguous interpretation for the word of the thunder. What Eliot himself defined as the water dripping form of his uh, few last verses gives sound, uh, gives sound to the pouring rain. But the meaning of the rain within the myth is unattainable. It fits the desert of the fifth canto while steering the dull roots of the uh, lilacs that sprouted from the dead bodies of the war. It offers salvation and takes the audience back to the beginning, trapping them as one more among the living dead. In the words of Rupert and Denley, in following these directions of significance, the reader encounters a reciprocal matrix of meaning and becomes entangled in interpretative activity and frustrated by an endless array of meaning. The impossibility to access univocal meaning ties the myth. The aspect of regeneration is intuitive, but the restorative extreme diesel brings a new life inextricable from the death by water prophesied by the tarot that was simultaneously true and false. Life is circular and eternal, but subsumed to unstoppable degeneration. The ghosts lingering in limbo are the liquidine like the Cumian civil in the poem Epigram. Her condition, as she languishes in a state of perpetual degeneration, after she asks Apollo to live as many years as there are grains in a handful of sand, but for God to ask for eternal youth, metonymically characterizes life in the wasteland, where rebirth entails an eternal return to sickness, violence, and despair. As in primitive myth, the wasteland is restored, but the meaning of regeneration has shifted. It is duplicitous, ambiguous, contradictory. As Magnelic Kearns argues, the reverse of vegetation is not a celebration of some joyous spring, but a return to a kind of bondage, a clutching, an attachment where the dead creek is no shelter, the cricket no relief. The renewal of the wasteland is a return to the wasteland. There is no escape because with no certain meaning, there can be no salvation. Recovering the original myth that should have provided order and meaning, Brooker and Bentley interpret the ending of the poem as the speaker rejecting the quest by turning his back to the wasted land. As they write, the king wondering whether he should at least set his land in order after the night has failed to save him, implies that he can detach himself from an inextricable connection with the land. A recognition that he is set free 
from the burden of being in. As Booker and Bentley write, from now on, it's everyone for himself. Community no longer exists. So to conclude, what is lost then is the core meaning of the myth, the ideological foundation, the mysticism of kinship, the warranty of social order, and the promise of survival and integration for the community. The wasteland is restored, it rains, life is born again. But the cruel foundation of life was unearthed by the contemplation and experience of horror during the war. The violence that holds sociopolitical order was brutally exposed, and there is no alternative to recognizing then the cruelty of April. Life goes on, but accepting the price of violence is a burden that can no longer be ignored. The wasteland extracts from tradition the medieval need of the grave. Sickness and sterility overwhelm the reader. The iconic figure of the Fisher King and ritual patterns of regeneration repeatedly recur in the text, adopting different shapes. Multivalence and duplicity destabilize meaning. The stories are retold interpretatively. The letter Sweeney is simultaneously Actium, Tereus, and Percival, signifying both chastity and lust, salvation and perdition. From the perspective of a myth critical lens, the poem represents the pre modern myth in a way that recognizes its ultimate meaning of social and spiritual regeneration. Still, by exposing the violence that sustains that possibility of redemption, the poem transfixes the traditional meaning of the myth. The multiplicity of tones in the poem, satirical, tragic, prophetic, mythical, carry a multivocal expression of lament about a world wracked by unprecedented violence, where the restoration of peace cannot truly repair what has been lost. In the great legend, the restoration of the wasteland entails the restitution of social and political order and the spiritual redemption of the community. In the wasteland, peace has been restored after the war, but after what Bradbury and McFarlane define as the destruction of civilization, there are no certainties, no reliable meaning, no possibility of transcendence to enchant the cruelty that was once veiled by the illusion of me. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rebecca, for the very well done presentation. So we have a question from Jose Manuel, I think that he wanted to enter and ask he asked it himself, but I will read it in the in the meanwhile. So he he says that April is the cruelest month. That that is one of the most quoted cute, cute verses, and you have related it with eternity. Could you develop this? Yes. Uh, I, when I say that April is cruel because April sort of signifies eternity, uh, what I mean to say is that. Um, well, the poem begins describing uh, the rebirth of the land in the spring, which is something that will happen forever, but, or at least uh, within our own human conception of forever, um, the idea that natural time is cyclical and therefore eternal after every winter comes spring, which is um, different, let's say, from uh, our own experience, right, as humans, when we die, uh, we are not born again, at least not in the same way, but when uh, winter comes, the land dies, is what uh, I mentioned of the winter of the year and the winter of the soul. In the winter of the year, the world is actually preparing for the spring, so the land will be born again. What the poem does at the very beginning is present that, the reverse of, of, uh, of the land, which I think is pretty striking because the poem is the wasteland. Well, what is the conflict with the wasteland? It's a land that is barren, that's desert, and that cannot read. Well, the very first line are already saying, well, this wasteland is actually producing flowers. It's actually being born again. Why? Because um, the tragedy for this wasteland is not so much that it is literally barren, but that if the new life that comes uh, with every year, with every coming spring, will forever be hunted by the death that the land holds within, which is a very literal death because we're here expressing um, the horror of a land filled with 
dead bodies because in the historical context of, of the poem, there had never been anything like this, like such an amount of young men so brutally killed. We're talking about millions of people killed, those bodies buried underground and serving as seed for the land. So life is eternal in the wasteland, meaning this wasteland will continue to exist after every winter, the spring will be, there will be always new life, but that new life will always be swollen with death, will always be haunted by the death that's feeding that new life, which is in itself an interesting idea, very perverse, because it, what it says is that prosperity, new life, redemption, regeneration, needs the violence, needs the massacre to exist and survive, which basically means that our society, after the war, uh, in order for it to uh, continue living in prosperity, needs the violence that sustains that society. I don't know if it's making sense here. Yes, maybe they're making too much then. But <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, Asuncion Lopez Varela asks, how could, uh, could, could perhaps Rebecca speak a little about Eliot's notion of myth as an objective correlative? And thank you for the presentation from Asun. Okay. Asun. Thank you very much, Asun. Yes, I mean, the objective correlative was um, basically a kind of poetic te technique that Eliot uh, advocated, which was if you want to represent, um, to express something rather than uh, directly referring to that thing you want to express, you have to create an image, a situation that evokes uh, that sentiment, right? That's the, the, the objective correlative. I think images taken from myth uh, many times work as objective correlative in, in the poem. For example, I think the myth of Philomela and how it appears as a leitmotif in the wasteland very much works as an objective correlative, um, which is basically a character in the case of Philomela, who appears and her voice is used, is heard uh, at different moments in the poem, um, is a particular story, a different story, different character, different situation that very well uh, evokes the same um, undercurrent of violence that I think defines the poem. And it's very easy to uh, connect the meaning and the emotions associated with that character, that situation, uh, with other themes, other characters that appear in the poem, such as the Titus, Cleopatra, and the two characters who cannot communicate in a game of chess. So I think that many times what Elliot does is he extracts themes and characters from myth and uses them as objective correlatives, that is, as situations and characters that can evoke the same meaning uh, that are actually um, expressed throughout the poem. Thank you very much uh, for the question. So uh, uh, I was thinking about the, I don't know how, how to say it, the, well, the, the, the way in which violence eats others to, to create something new. Maybe I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the, well, the, the, the world wars, the world wars, uh, and also a commentary from, from Elliot that you mentioned in, in the last question. So the, this endless cycle of violence and rebirth, and I, I'm not sure if it can be tied to, to the boom of of wastelands in, in media, like for example in apocalyptic media or these zombie narratives. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you can say something. I think, I think that the good thing about the wasteland as a myth and, and how the huge presence that it has, for example, in Anglophone culture in the 20th century, and a lot of that, by the way, uh, we owe it to Eliot and to the immediate influence of the poem. Uh, is that it has become a sort of, there are critics who call it, instead, who call it the image of the wasteland. It's not, a, it's not the myth itself, because the myth is sort of remote for this uh, cultural product, but it's, the presence of the wasteland is so big and, and, and so, uh, so well established in the canon that it has become a sort of common image. So it's, it's actually a, um, an image um, that you can find with certain um, 
frequency in apocalyptic fiction, as you said. Uh, probably if you were to read, I don't know, I'm thinking of something like The Sun by Stephen King, something like that. You have to, you can actually trace many of the meanings, many of the characters, many of the patterns that you find in wasteland literature. Uh, the beginning of the presentation, uh, Jose Manuel mentioned uh, my book, Wasteland Modernism, in which I analyze different texts. And part of the argument there is that um, criticism has established a kind of subcategory within modernism, which is wasteland modernism, which is basically about the prominence of uh, the wasteland myth, but many times not an explicit representation of the mythical characters or different mythings, but just the overall meaning uh, in the myth as being uh, fundamental for a large section of the modernist canon. This, of course, has a later influence in postmodernity uh, post and in postmodernist authors, for example, Pynchon, and so on. So what happens is that there is a pervasiveness of wasteland motives and wasteland themes in Anglophone culture in the 20th century that I think permeates uh, apocalyptic fiction in many ways. Um, and of course, the undercurrent of violence and, and this basic assumption that life is sustained by violence, I think it's a big part of that. Yeah. Yes, thank you. That was very interesting. So uh, last, the, the last commentary by Ana Maria Gallinal. She said, well, thank you for inviting us to interpret April today. Um, she, she's thinking about the reflection of the turn of the usual vision of spring as a season of life and, and the transformation of, of, the, of the season of, of spring towards pain and death. I'm not sure I, I understand um, because I, I think I understood two different things. One has to do with the tarot, which I'm not sure I got, and also the transformation, I suppose, of the typical traditional meaning of a spring. Yes, yes. Um, I, okay, yes, if I am not mistaken, she can add anything and I, I will answer it later. Um, I think. Um, Actually, you can connect to things because uh, I permit out in the poem is a great example of how, uh, as Coyle said, the poem inhabits both sides of an opposition or both sides of a contradiction. Because the presentation of Tarot seems to be presented how something that was once mystical and magical is now basically it, it presents man's associates as a sort of con artist that is taking the money. Uh, from the characters in the poem and just make it reading cards that are made up. They are not even real cards. And she insists that she takes uh, her own back because she cannot trust other people. Um, so in a way, it seems to be representing how ancient ritual is debased, but then as the poem always does, it, turns, it sort of twists around and turns out that Mahan Sosoti was right. She was actually predicting everything that was going to happen in the poem. And the most iconic thing she said is fear death by water. Uh, so you have to, in the end, trust her words and actually fear death by water. So when it ends, at the end it rains, the meaning of the rain is ambivalent. It, it actually will um, uh, bring along the restoration of the land, but something very ominous, something very dark is also coming with that rain. Um, so it, ha it sort of signifies something that was lost, a traditional meaning that has been lost, and then the magic is sort of um, regained, but uh, it has gone dark. And I think something similar happens with the meaning of a spring. I think uh, if you trace the, the, the first lines in the poem and the influences in those first lines, I think it's obvious that the main reference to Chaucer and the beginning of the Canterbury Tales, which actually begin sort of singing to uh, the rebirth of the land in April. The first word is also April. So it seems to be recalling uh, the whole of, lit tradi of literary tradition in English, and then the references to lilacs, which for me is also a clear reference to Whitman, um, um, when lilacs last in Dorian Bloom, uh, poems he wrote uh, as part of his uh, Leaves of Grass um, series, uh, in, this, in this case, as an elegy for Abraham Lincoln. Um, and it seems to be sort of uh, collecting the traditional meaning of a spring and saying, well, with traditional literature, we celebrate the coming of the spring because it means new life, it means hope, a new beginning. Also, there is a tradition in uh, American letters of mourning during springtime in a way opposing the lament expressed by the poetic voice 
and the pain expressed by the uh, felt and expressed by the speaker with a world that continues to uh, be born and continues to regenerate and continues to bring new life. But what Elliot does is again take that meaning and twist it around and saying, well, the problem is not so far that the world is in pain when spring is bringing along new life. The drama here is that the spring itself is the source of cruelty because by bringing new life, it's enforcing eternity upon a world that is um, in a state of complete and irreparable degeneration. That's why I think the, the epigraph that I mentioned with the myth of the Cumian civil is so meaningful because the Cumian civil lived forever, but since he forgot to ask for eternal youth, she will live forever and ever and ever and ever, but continually degenerating. She, um, and I think that's, that's, by the way, a very good objective correlative of what the poem is actually expressing, which is that, yes, spring will bring new life, but that new life, what it's actually doing is making the wasteland eternal because it will physically regenerate, but he cannot escape the death and the violence it has within. So it sort of uses the traditional meaning of spring to twist it around, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so it was very interesting. I think we can finish the seminar here. So thank you all for assisting. And also thank you all for those who will watch it later on another day. So we'll see each other next month. And thank you, Rebecca, for your interesting presentation. Thank you so much, Adrian. Thank you.